Viewpoint is a news interview series presented in the belief that close journalistic scrutiny of civic officials is in the public interest. Tonight's program is Viewpoint Mayor Moscone. For Channel 6, here is reporter Jerry Burns. Good evening and welcome to Viewpoint. Our guest this evening, George Moscone, is mayor of the city and county of San Francisco. He's a former member of the Board of Supervisors, a former state senator, and has been mayor since 1975 or he was elected in 1975, he's been mayor since January 1976. Mr. Mayor, the, uh, the biggest issue you seem to be associated with these days, in the public press anyway, is whether the San Francisco Giants go away part-time or not. Uh, a lot of people who aren't baseball fans wonder if this is really a significant issue or not. Uh, what's, what's so important about whether the Giants play half their games in Oakland or go to Oakland entirely? Well, it's a viewpoint, I think. I think if people uh, <coughs> think that there's something terribly important about associating a city with a franchise, a major, major league uh, franchise, they were on my side. If they just wanted to see Major League Baseball, I didn't think they worried much about traveling across the Bay Bridge and seeing them at the Oakland Coliseum. I'm not sure what the public pulse is on the subject, but it seemed to me that if we built a stadium that uh, cost some $23 million, specifically for the Giants, that the people must have uh, had some feeling that associating it with San Francisco was terribly important to them. Some of the things that have happened since we made our stand and eventually made our offer uh, have indicated to me that people are satisfied with the result as it relates to the principle of keeping your name attached to the baseball franchise. They have not been upset, at least those that have talked to me about the subject, about a split schedule and yet they were very grateful that we were able to keep the name San Francisco attached to, to the Giants, so that indicates that maybe we were right. And the fact that Oakland fights very much the question of what the, the name ought to be indicates that from their viewpoint, it's a, a terribly important issue as well. So well, in, a lar in the large perspective, what is the significance of whether or not San Francisco has a major league baseball team with its name attached. Well, I'm not sure the Giants bring any great deal of money to San Francisco. I'm, you know, I'm not sure one way or the other. <clears throat> but I am sure that throughout the country, uh, uh, the people associate San Francisco with being at least big enough in stature, if not in population, to be able to warrant uh, a major league franchise. And that's true with the 49ers. It's true with the, with the Giants. Uh, they publicize the fact that uh, in New York, uh, they don't have a team, a football team. And yet, uh, at least the Giants are not attached to New York. They play in New Jersey, and yet they call them the New York Giants, and that was a matter of high principle to the Big Apple. I suspect uh, the issue back there is very much the same as it was here. So I think associating San Francisco with being big enough to warrant and merit a uh, franchise, which is a rare event, and not too many cities have them in baseball, uh, indicates a matter of pride, a matter of uh, importance. I'm not sure it measures out the dollars and cents because I think if people came to Oakland to see the Giants, they'd spend as much money in San Francisco as they might otherwise. But the principle is a terribly important one to uh, San Franciscans if I'm to gauge what they write and tell me orally. So it's just a matter of feeling like a major league town and, and, and whether it attracts tourists or conventions or companies to, to locate here, uh, you're not sure, but it's it's just a feeling of being a big league city generally. Absolutely. Uh, when Oakland came into uh, the Bay Area, and that was some t many years after the Giants were well established here, they fought tooth and nail and they put up their financial responsibility to get the A's. Uh, it certainly wasn't because they wanted to see Major League Baseball. All they had to do was pay the toll and come over to Candlestick. It was because they associated some civic pride and maybe nothing more than pride. But I mean, that's not an insignificant issue with people who, who run their cities. Uh, and as a consequence, they pursued it and, and put up some important money to support it. Are you satisfied with the proposal at its current state, which would have the Giants play one less than half of their home games yeah. in Oakland? Yes, I, I'm really not concerned uh, about the number of games. I think that was an equitable disposition, and it never was an issue. The major issue, as we told the people from Oakland from the beginning, was that we were not going to surrender the name, and we certainly were going to make sure that every dollar to which the Giants and the city of San Francisco was entitled, as a matter of our agreement with them, was at least held secure, and we've, we've made that possible through our agreement. So that notwithstanding the fact that the Giants conceivably will play half their games in Oakland, the city expects to get the same amount of revenue? We don't expect it. It's a matter of agreement. 
paint, the Giants will come up out of their pockets with the, no less revenue than the city has been receiving. Together with the fact that we have a guarantee from the, uh, from the league. But what about the, uh, the idea that the Giants will be known as the San Francisco Giants everywhere in the hemisphere, and presumably in the free world, outside of Oakland, California? Well, I can understand their goal, but we, we, uh, we set the uh, direction, and we said that you could call them the Giants. We didn't tell them they could call them something that they wanted to call them. They are the Giants, and we take the SF off the cap if that's what Bob Lurie wants to do. And that was just a business deal, believing that uh, their parochial views, and I'm not minimizing them because we have the same ones on our side, uh, would generate a greater degree of, uh, of uh, attendance and enthusiasm, and as a consequence, was money in the, in the coffers. So it's San Francisco Giants throughout the country, including San Francisco, and in Oakland, uh, it must be no different than the Giants. If they want to go San Francisco Giants, which I suspect they don't want to do, that's fine, but if they want to go otherwise, it can only be the Giants. Well, they can't call them the Oakland Giants. No, no. Uh, you object to any... Uh compromise name like the Golden Gate Giants or the Bay Area Giants? Yes, I did and do. And as a matter of fact, the issue is behind us. Uh, that is no longer an issue. The only issue now is the remaining $1 million that uh, Oakland has demanded of, of uh, Charlie Finley. They have received 2250000 to hold them harmless from what they've lost for their 10-year lease. Uh, they want another million, and uh, Mr. Finley says he won't do it. Lurie says he won't do it. The American League uh, says they won't do it, so uh, uh, maybe it's all uh, a good exercise in political uh, uh, histrionics and nothing more. If you're going to let the Giants play half their games or almost half their home games in Oakland, why can't you get us a few home games of the uh, Golden State Warriors? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, they have a lease right now. If we were to build a suitable auditorium uh, that would accommodate the, the Warriors, I have every reason to believe that Mr. Muley would negotiate with San Francisco officials when his lease ended. Uh, we would do that if we thought it made sense economically to the city, and there's, there's never been an abandonment of the principle there might be a sports arena in San Francisco. I think first we're going to build the convention exhibit hall, and once that's behind us, then we can look to what we would call luxuries at the moment, uh, sports arenas. Are you saying there's a possibility that down the road any given period of time, there might be a sports arena as part of the Yerba Buena complex? Oh, yes. Oh, I think that's a strong probability. And it would house, I think, uh, basketball, potentially, hockey, potentially, and uh, certainly other non-athletic events that could uh, pay the cost of such an arena. Well, do we, shall we look forward to seeing Yerba Buena built in our lifetime? Well, Jerry, as you know, I have put my uh, prestige to the extent uh, it's of importance on the line. I believe we've done everything that uh, politically needed to be done that was neglected before in order to make it a, a, a proper uh, expectation for the city. We've worked with federal officials and all of the city people that really need to be satisfied. We've had 52 public hearings, thousands of hours of public debate on the subject, submitted it on the ballot. The people voted for it. The hotel tax is going to support it, so the property taxpayers won't pay for it. I can't conceive of anything that remains to be an obstacle, and I think it's just a question of people being so cynical. They've heard so long, for 10 years, it was going to be built, and they're not going to believe it until they see it happening. And I think that's a good, healthy cynicism, but I think we can meet it. There have been some projects talked about for many years that have finally gotten underway under the Moscone administration. I think particularly of the addition to the Opera House and the, final, the construction, finally, of the Performing Arts Center. Uh, but there are, all, there are things like the Yerba Buena Center, which are you know, still bombed out uh, deserts practically. One of them, for example, is uh, the site of Playland at the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any realistic possibility of a development there that, that uh, you think the city and the neighbors will buy? Well, I'm not, uh, people don't know that we haven't prepared this, but we haven't. The fact is that two days ago, uh, developers, potential developers of Playland at the beach came in and talked with us, and we brought in our planning director, Rai Okamoto, and uh, uh, we think that uh, they have a proposal that would be regarded as satisfactory in the sense that it would respect the needs of that neighborhood, would respect the uh, environment in general, and would be an economic advantage to the city, plus providing a mix of housing that is not outside the reach of people who would be called moderate income uh, uh, taxpayers. So, yeah, I think there's a good chance, now that we've moved away from some of the more bizarre approaches to Playland at the beach, and uh, people who have a lot of money but don't want to 
throw it away, think it important enough to come in and talk to the mayor and have me bring in the planning director to talk about the proper strategy to respect all of the political needs of neighborhood people and at the same time the planning direction of the city. Some of the other things, the projects that have been on the drawing boards now for what seemed like an endless number of years and include the, um, the Saks Fifth Avenue development and the Neiman Marcus development. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly Saks seems to be in gear again yeah. and that's heading towards construction probably. Uh, I don't know what the status of Neiman Marcus is. Are we seeing a new era where some of those extreme uh, environmental uh, roadblocks to these projects have been modified somewhat so that they are finally going to now, move ahead? No, I, uh, I don't think it's a question of the people who've been concerned about the environment changing their views. It's been really a question of those developers who regarded them as insignificant entities in the whole process, finally saying, hey, this is real. These people really care about their city, and we're going to take the kind of pains in our planning, in our discussion, in our dialogue, our community meetings, that will pay proper heed and attention to their needs. That, for example, uh, it, again, people might think we prepared this one, but it was yesterday that the people from Neiman Markets came in and wanted direction, political direction on how they should go. And we had the same cast of characters, including Mr. Okamoto, come in there. And the advice I gave them was simply this. That A, nobody believes their statement that uh, the, y, the city of Paris, and therefore Neiman Marcus, uh, has to be so dramatically changed in order to be uh, successful from a merchandise point of view. I said, look, I'll take your word, that's the case, but until you go out and explain from the basis of your expertise why it has to be done differently, as you at least attempt to pr protect the rotunda, that you can get off center, dead center. And, and I must say, the people from Neiman Marcus apparently have a good and clear understanding that as important as San Francisco is to their development of themselves as a major retail corporation, they know they have got to, to sit down with environmentalists and talk with them. So I believe that it's not been a question of envir environmentalists not caring anymore. It's a question of developers saying these people obviously care and they have some political clout. And so we're going to sit down and explain to them the problems we have so we can get them working with us. Isn't, um, aren't empty storefronts and developers who are stopped from building modest buildings uh, more of a drawback to being a major league city than having a no question. major league baseball? No, no question about it. No question. But nonetheless, the, the political obstacles, I don't, I'm not just talking about demonstrations, but I mean the, the law has been changed to dramatically reflect the, the change in attitude of government toward the rights of people with a small p. And so developers and everyone else has learned that unless they can get some understanding from the people, whether they be in ecologists or just neighborhood-oriented people, that if they don't sit down and talk, then they're going to end up in a court of law. And a court of law is going to stop any kind of development, at least until such time as people are able to get their viewpoint across. So why shouldn't government, before they go to the courts, sit down and appreciate that fact? Now, the reality, therefore, is that the world has changed. A democracy has given some teeth in it these days. It frustrates mayors sometimes. You know, I'd like to move many things aside, but I hope I'm politically pragmatic enough to know that if you do that, it becomes a, more of a delay in the long run, and you might as well sit down and talk with the people and get their viewpoint. And in the last analysis, many developments have become better developments from the point of view even of the corporate owner, as well as the public at large, because they were forced to sit down and talk with people, some of whom have some damn good ideas. We've talked about the giants. <coughs> Excuse me. We've talked about development. Um, well, are those the biggest issues facing the city today? Oh, no. What are? Well, the biggest issues are uh, the ability of the city, through its taxpayers, to finance the kind of services that those very same taxpayers insist continue, but at a, a cost that they can afford. And when you put on top of that the layer, the very substantial probability, if you will, at least possibility, of a jarvis Gan measure <coughs> that could, in effect, change totally the direct the direction of San Francisco and all other urban environments, then I think it, you have to say that money, along with crime, which is the basic inherent need of people to have a sense of personal security, rate 
the number one and two positions, whichever way you want to talk about them, and then the question of development. And baseball and recreation, unfortunately or fortunately, go way down the line. But when the crisis is before you, it becomes a number one priority. What does Jarvis Gann mean to San Francisco? It means the loss of approximately a quarter of a billion dollars in ad valorem taxes, together with a substantial loss of revenue sharing funds, federal funds, which are dependent, at least in part, on the amount of local taxes that you raise, and so that the lower the amount of taxes you raise at the ad valorem level, the lower contribution from the federal government. It means a substantial loss of CETA funds because they are, uh, those monies are for giving people jobs that are on top of jobs you already uh, will fund at the local tax level. And to be terribly honest with you, Jerry, and I know everybody's going to say this is a scare tactic, with the amount of money that will be left available to San Francisco if Proposition 13 passes, the fact will be that we will do well even to be able to substantially finance our police and fire departments. Libraries and schools and uh, recreation and park and health facilities will either be non-existent in the absence of some different contributions from the federal and state government, which I don't see forthcoming, uh, or uh, or uh, they're going to be substantially crippled, and our ability to provide services is not going to be anything but a matter of history. The popular myth is that uh, if Jarvis Gann passes, that's Proposition 13, that the state legislature will then adopt other funding mechanisms like a much higher income tax and will make up that money. You don't expect that to happen. Well, I don't expect it to happen for two reasons. First of all, Jarvis Gann requires a two-thirds vote to do that, and uh, I've been in the legislature long enough to know that no matter what the crisis might be, it's very difficult to get two out of every third person up there to agree. Secondly, uh, if that were true, then I'm not terribly sure that the people who at least ostensibly support Jarvis Gann would be so supportive of it because they're going to be hit really through the teeth uh, thereafter. And as a consequence, you'll find that... Uh, that uh, if they believe that to be the case, Proposition 13 wouldn't be of any import to them. The fact is, that's an argument for Jarvis and Gann to make to the people. The reality of it is that we will be reduced to the level of services of Jarvis Gant without additional revenues. As a politician who's run both locally and statewide, what do you think the chances are for passage of Proposition 13? Oh, I think they're good. I think, I'm sorry to say, I think they're good. And I think that's true even with the passage of the Bear Bill, which happens to have been, I think, an offspring of the uh, fear uh, born out of Jarvis Gann. But until I see a campaign really rolling around that, uh, that shows people the kind of city in which they will live, if indeed Jarvis Gann passes, then I think the people are going to look at it very simplistically. Look, I pay too much taxes, particularly property taxes, and I want to do anything I can to cast my dissent vote, and Prop 13 looks like an avenue of redress. Do you plan to campaign vigorously against 13? Well, I think I must. I think I must. I have every chance I can. I think I've got to take to the road if that's necessary in order to try to convince the people that we need relief, but this is not the answer. You mentioned crime. Uh, in the first part of your administration, anyway, your police chief, uh, Chief Gain, was a very controversial person in the community. It seems to be less so, somehow. Uh, would you assess his, uh, his uh, performance in office so far from your point of view? I would. <laughs> I would assess it uh, and I would give it a good grade. Uh, and one of the reasons, if you don't mind me saying so, is that the usual device of trying to terrify a mayor, that unless he changes police chiefs in midstream, he's going to not be reelected, we've been able to withstand. Uh, and therefore, those people that were set out to, uh, to change the views of Charlie Gain by having him fired by me and by the political coercion, have I think come to grips with the fact that he's going to be the police chief of this city so long as he does a good job, and that is measured by, unfortunately, statistics. We've been gauged over the years by the number of murders and muggings that uh, reflect out in FBI statistics. If we are gauged that way in a negative way, now those same statistics which show we have major decreases in crime ought to reflect well on the chief, and I, I'm going to so regard them. So I think the chief is less controversial because more people believe that I am supportive of him uh, than anything else. He's the same chief as before, maybe a little more politic. He was a kind of a free swinger, maybe a little more diplomatic. But the fact is his view of administration of an important element of government, the police department, 
has really not been changed. It's a question, I think, of people knowing that he is there so long as those stats remain in the kind of form that they are. Where was the criticism coming from? Who, uh, who in well, the community wanted to? Well, those who were part of the establishment who have liked to, to believe that they ran the police department, people within it before, uh, the POA, the people who took the, 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 the police department in 1975 out on strike, uh, they're part of it. They don't want change. They were enjoying some of their changes. And that doesn't reflect on the majority of police, but the hierarchy of the rank and file didn't like it and still don't. Uh, secondly, uh, because there was a difficulty with uh, an individual in the black community, Rodney Williams, uh, who, uh, who was not given the kind of uh, advance that many people in the black community felt he should have had as a matter of commitment, regardless of what had happened up to that point, uh, felt that uh, Chief Gain was not uh, sympathetic to the needs of the black community. And uh, that really put together two very different allies. They started working together, and it, it got to be very critical. But I, uh, I, maybe I'm being immodest. I think that we gritted our teeth and said, look, we judge the police chief by what the realities are and not what appears to be the fact. Let's see if the people won't rally to him. And I think at the moment they are. Did you advise him at any point uh, to uh, become more politic, to take a lower profile uh, than he no, did at the beginning? No, I really didn't. Uh, he knew that himself. You know, he, he would come to me and said, Mr. Mayor, I... I really don't want to become a liability to you. And the moment I do, then I really ought to leave on my own accord. I want to do what is right. And I want to assure you that that's uppermost in my mind uh, in terms of how I will deliver the message to my department. Uh, I know you don't want me to change my views because that's not your, your cut. But I want you to know I care. And to the extent I can make that change uh, diplomatically, I will do so. And thus far, he has. I've told Chief Gain always, you know, Charlie, they ask me all the time, are you going to be chief next month? And I tell him, Charlie, I don't know, because I don't know who's going to be in this administration next month. I think, particularly in the police department, that I have got to gauge performance on a day-to-day -day basis. And he says, I have no quarrel with that. This job is sensitive. If I can't do the job from your perspective or mine or both of ours together, then indeed I ought to leave without you firing me. That's the relationship we have, and I think it's a very healthy one. If there is a second Moscone uh, administration, uh, which presupposes that you'll run for office again and win again, do you expect Charlie Gain to be part of it again? Uh, it tied into my last answer. If, if, uh, and if the numbers well, remain good? The numbers remain well, and the people are able to uh, feel a reasonable sense of security, as you can in modern urban America, then he will remain the chief. Do you uh, intend to run for re-election? Well, Jerry, let me just say, I don't want to lose my rights to uh, appear on television. Uh, so I can just tell you this. Uh, it's the grandest moment of my life to be the mayor of this city. Uh, they only give you two shots at it. And uh, I'd be very surprised if I didn't uh, take advantage of that. Do you rule out the possibility of running again for statewide office as you did yes. briefly? Yes, I do. Four years ago? Yes, I do. I know it's never proven to rule out, rule out any possibility. All I know is this, that I've been able to keep my head together and my physical well-being together in this very demanding job because I know that this is literally the end of my political line. And that makes a very important difference in the way in which you conduct yourself. You worry about the city of San Francisco and not how you might reflect outward in Los Angeles and San Diego where all the votes are. And I've come to grips with that. It's been good for me. It's been good for my family to know that. And uh, even the Downing Thomases are starting to wonder if I indeed am not telling the truth. Why has it been so difficult for mayors in California, and I presume elsewhere, to run successfully for higher office? Uh, Mayor Wilson in San Diego doesn't seem to be moving much in the Republican gubernatorial race. Mayor Bradley has been talked of for, uh, about running for other office, but he's never chosen to do so. Is there some inherent problem? Well, I can only guess that because you cannot uh, delegate the decision to another body as you can as a, a statewide office holder or somebody who's not in office at all, that uh, you have to pick up your fair share of opposition. You've got to make those decisions, and I haven't yet seen a decision that is made in the mayor's office that doesn't have a downside as well as an upside. So I think uh, being on the line has a mixed blessing. You get some name identification, but you also get some... Uh, some 
I issue identification, and you, in this very diverse world, uh, you're lucky if you can find 10 people who are agreeing on the same subject as, as, as much as the 20 million people who make up this state. In the uh, three or so minutes we have left, uh, can George Moscone step out of, uh, George Moscone, the political analyst, step out of George Moscone, the mayor, for a minute and tell me what you think are your strengths and weaknesses if you do run for re-election in 1979? Well, I think my weaknesses are those I've just referred to. I've had to make some decisions that uh, estranged many people. Apparently, there's a, some group of people that believed I was going to give uh, certain people within the labor movement anything they wanted, right, wrong, or indifferent, and they, they got a very different feeling after the, unfortunately, the impeachment ceremony that took place with respect to Joe Mazzola. I think the strength is the fact that people have seen me being attacked and I think now understanding that much of that attack was uh, a very personal one and was not uh, in the public interest as was uh, alleged to be the case, that I've stood reasonably tall and won the fight uh, with Proposition B and that uh, I'm not going to be pushed around, that I'm, you know, I'm going to make my decisions, which I like to think are fairly impartial, and that they don't have to believe some of the rhetoric that preceded my first election, namely that I was going to give the city away to to those that wanted to spend it into a bankruptcy, that uh, uh, labor and other public officials at other levels were going to manipulate the strings of George Moscone. I think they see me as an independent person, and while they probably won't burn incense at my shrine, I think the <laughs> problems that uh, were very important and upon which my opponents capitalized before have found to be not anything but political rhetoric. So that's an advantage. Four years of of being able to show what I am, for better or worse, will give me the ability to be judged more honestly. And I think out there, there are more people who will accept the way in which we've run this administration than there are those who would accept somebody else who's a, a political opponent of mine. In the last minute, let me ask, uh, in 1975, when you first ran, one of your weaker areas was west of Twin Peaks. Yeah. Uh, it was John Barb Gelada's strong spot. Uh, have you, do you expect to do any better among those people? Why should they vote for you if you run again when they didn't last time? Well, because I think they thought I was going to give the city away to uh, other interests, that I was not going to be good for the business community of San Francisco. I think they're fair-minded people, and they've seen I've not given things away, that uh, the business climate of San Francisco, if anything, has been strengthened. So uh, I have to assume they're honest people. And if they weigh the evidence that uh, all their fears before are, have not been realized, then why not give me the benefit of a second term? It sounds reasonable. Mayor Moscone, we appreciate your being with us tonight. Thank you for your full and complete answers to the questions. Our guest tonight on Viewpoint has been George Moscone, Mayor of San Francisco. Please join me again next week when my guest will be Supervisor Harvey Milk. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Jim. This has been Viewpoint Mayor Moscone, the 28th program in our series designed to help you become more informed on the viewpoints of your community leaders. The opinions expressed on Viewpoint are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the policies of Viacom Cablevision or the opinions of its management or employees. Viewpoint Mayor Moscone has been presented in the public interest by Viacom Cablevision of San Francisco.